His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. began a um, series we entitled Maximum Marriage, and I believe the way they do that uh, on television is they say we, at this time we interrupt our regularly scheduled program uh, for a special bulletin or whatever, and so uh, this week we're going to interrupt our regularly scheduled program uh, for, a, uh, for a message out of the book of Jeremiah, uh, so if you want to start hunting Jeremiah, uh, he's in there, I prom- well I don't want to promise you, uh, I said, uh, Rhonda's daddy years ago, I remember bought a Bible and uh, got to looking, and there were several Old Testament books missing. Uh, and so when they bound it, they left part of it out. And so I don't want to promise you it's there, but um, he should be there. Uh, find Psalms and turn uh, to the right. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll pick back up on, uh, on maximum marriage next week. Uh, I know uh, I said that today was supposed to be the day uh, for husbands, and uh, I noticed that a lot of them decided they needed to go on vacation. And so uh, we'll wait till they get home and welcome them back. And so uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. This morning I want to look at a passage that 
uh, could very easily uh, be, uh, the message could be drawn from uh, quite a few passages throughout the Bible, uh, because this passage reveals to us uh, some principles, uh, some, the, the way that God uh, has handled nations throughout history. Uh, as uh, we teach that God uh, never changes, that He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, we could just as easily be looking at, uh, in the book of Jonah, how God dealt with Nineveh. Uh, we could be looking at any number of passages and how uh, God has dealt with Israel or Judah. Uh, we could be going back to the time of Noah. Uh, we could be looking at the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, and uh, any number uh, of nations throughout history uh, and see that God's pattern uh, has remained the same. And I think it is a warning uh, that we need today uh, in America as we celebrate uh, our independence, we celebrate uh, our freedom, our anniversary. Uh, I think uh, that the United States of America, I don't believe I would get uh, much argument from any reasonable person uh, that America is declining. Uh, I, I don't know that there is anything that uh, most people would measure that is good uh, that uh, we would say is improving. Uh, even the numbers that do look uh, a little better uh, are not particularly encouraging. I, I will tell you that, uh, that uh, it, uh, they are telling us that uh, the number of uh, abortions has declined uh, slightly in the the last few years, but uh, even then we're still at uh, just a little over uh, a million abortions a year, uh, which uh, I don't know that uh, there's, there's just no good way uh, to say that. Uh, there, there's no good way uh, to bring that across. Uh, I believe it was Ronald Reagan who said uh, that he had noticed that the only people that, were for, that everybody that was for abortion had already been born. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a pretty uh, true statement. And so this morning, as we look in this passage in Jeremiah, again, uh, it uh, could be drawn from any number uh, of nations' history. Uh, but where we're picking up in Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, was a prophet uh, to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, Judah was, uh, was the, again, the southern kingdom. It was made up of two tribes of Israel. Uh, because of their uh, disagreements, because of some of the problems, uh, they had divided. And ten tribes uh, had went north and had formed uh, what we know as the nation of Israel. And two tribes had taken the southern section and had formed the kingdom of Judah. And so again, both of them were both uh, Jewish people. They just couldn't even get along uh, with their self. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, had already been taken captive, had already because of uh, their sin, because of their wickedness, because uh, of their idolatry, they were already uh, under captivity, already uh, under bondage, and Judah uh, was uh, running a close second. Uh, they were already, uh, they were already uh, very evil, very wicked, and Jeremiah uh, comes along, and Jeremiah uh, is sent to prophesy to the people of Judah, to warn them uh, that uh, if they didn't change their ways, if they they didn't uh, correct their course that they too uh, would be uh, taken captive, that they would be uh, overrun. And so Jeremiah uh, spends a great deal of his life uh, crying out to the people. And as uh, we know from studying his life, uh, not only did they not, did they not listen, uh, they just completely rejected Jeremiah, uh, didn't want anything to do with him, ridiculed him, and, uh, and, and basically persecuted him uh, for, his, uh, for, his, uh, for his prophecy uh, of the impending judgment. Uh, in, in fact, we see in this chapter, uh, in just a moment, we see that, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the people of Judah actually get to the point where instead of listening to the prophecy of Jeremiah, they come to the point uh, where they say, well, if that's the case, why try? Uh, why even bother? Uh, we're just going to keep on doing what we do and not even bother, uh, which in many ways, I, I think when we look at this passage, you'll see uh, is uh, very similar uh, to what is going on, what has taken place uh, in America. So, uh, if you found your place in the book of Jeremiah, or if you haven't either, uh, stand up anyway. As we read this text, uh, I want us to read this uh, entire, not the entire passage, but these 12 verses, um, and uh, kind of comment on them as we go, uh, and, and just uh, to, uh, because we are kind of jumping in in the middle uh, of Jeremiah's work, um, and uh, make a few comments as we go to kind of explain and pick up where we are. Uh, Jeremiah tells us here, he says, this is the word uh, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And so what we have here is God speaking to Jeremiah. 
He sends him down to the potter's house. And uh, most of you are uh, familiar with the potter, the guy that sits with the clay on the wheel and uh, makes things, uh, and, and uh, artistic things, bowls, all those kind of things. And, and so God sends him down there. He's got a, uh, an object lesson for Jeremiah. And he says to him, uh, Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter, to make it. So the object lesson was this. Uh, as Jeremiah goes into the potter's house, the, the potter is spinning some uh, piece on the wheel. Uh, don't know if he's making a bowl, a vase, or whatever, uh, but perhaps you've seen a, a potter. Uh, and as they work, and, and it's an amazing process, they take a big thump and thump it down, and they begin to shape it, and, and, and up comes a bowl. Uh, but as sometimes is the case, uh, as the potter makes it, he decides it's not what he wants it to be. There's something, he says here, that it was marred. And so the potter does what perhaps you've seen the potter do. He takes that the piece and it's got a mark, and he just just whops it down and, and makes a new and begins again. And so Jeremiah sees that, and God says to him, He says, "O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter?" God is saying to Jeremiah, "You go tell the people of Judah. You go tell the Jews. I made you like the potter made the vase. And if I don't like what I see, I'll stomp you out and I'll start over." I will wipe you out, and I will make something new. And he said, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it, and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return you now, every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray today that you'll take uh, the words of Jeremiah, uh, God, that you directed to, uh, at Judah, uh, and God, let us realize that uh, there, are, uh, there is a method there. There is a pattern that you have shown us throughout your word of your dealings uh, with the people, your dealings with nations and their sin. Uh, your punishment, your judgment uh, for iniquity. And God, I pray today, uh, God, as we look around our nation, God, we thank you for this nation. Uh, believe, Lord, that uh, it is uh, the greatest nation. God, that you have, uh, that this nation has been blessed beyond uh, our imagination, beyond uh, anything we deserve. But God, we understand as we uh, look around, as we see the news, as we uh, see what's happening around us, uh, God, we realize that our nation is very quickly uh, and very abruptly turning from you and from your work. And God, we pray today, God, that we would see revival begin uh, in this land, that we would see the land do as you say, uh, turn back. Because, we, because, God, we realize today, just like you told Jeremiah, we are uh, but clay in your hands, and you could wipe us out uh, and start anew. And, God, that it is in your power uh, to pluck up, to destroy, or to plant. And so, Lord, we pray today that you'll stir our hearts this morning, God, that revival uh, would begin, repentance would begin uh, in this place today. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I realize today that when we look at this text, it is directly uh, spoken to the people of Judah. But as we know, God never changes. And so if these were uh, the methods and the ways that God would deal uh, with Judah, again, we could say He dealt in the same way uh, with Nineveh. He dealt the same way with the people during Noah's time. Uh, he dealt with the same, uh, same method to Egypt, to Syria, Babylon. Uh, every one of these nations dealt uh, and received the same opportunity, the same uh, blessing, the same curse. And so uh, this morning it would be uh, foolhardy uh, of us to think that America uh, is any different. Here as uh, we celebrate uh, our anniversary this weekend, we celebrate uh, our freedom. For some reason it appears uh, that the United States has decided uh, that we have, uh, we have uh, arrived, that we are uh, all we need to be, that we are safe and secure. I'm reminded, I, I've shared with you before the words 
uh, of Ted Turner, uh, who was uh, the owner for many years of the Braves and uh, TBS, and uh, many people know the name Ted Turner. Uh, and to paraphrase him, not a direct quote, uh, but several years ago, Ted Turner made the statement uh, that America has come to the place where we no longer need this notion, this notion of God. He said that there was a time in America when we had depression and war and and, and all kinds of problems and and people needed a crutch like God. But we have arrived at a point today where we are successful. Uh, We have uh, proceeded to the point uh, where we no longer need some idea of God. In other words, what he was saying and what he was brave enough or dumb enough to say out loud, what many seem to be thinking and uh, and many seem to be living is that we have uh, ar- arrived, we have grown past the need of a God. As the Ju- people of Judah said here, we're going to do it our way. We're going to live and do things our way. We, we live in a time where uh, just in the last few weeks uh, we have seen another uh, activist judge. And uh, this morning, let me say before I get too far into the message, I'm not picking a side. I'm not picking Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, any of them. I don't like any of them. They're all crooks. And so, uh, you know, I don't trust any of them any further than I can throw them. If they were honest when we elected them, within a few weeks, they'll be corrupt. That's my opinion. I don't mean to be a pessimist. I'm just a realist. That's my observation about politicians. I don't trust them. I don't care which party they represent. And so, that being said... They just don't get, don't get all bent out of shape and say, I'm taking either side. I'd like to vote them all out and start over. So that being said, we live in a time where we have uh, judges who are coming up and, and, and states who are taking and by popular vote uh, of the people voting uh, against uh, making a law uh, that they decide for their state and saying uh, that they are opposed, that the only marriage in, in their state is a marriage between one man and one woman and some guy because he's got a robe or some woman uh, because they've given them a gavel have decided that uh, we're going to overrule the, uh, the vote of the people. We're going to decide uh, what's best for you. You don't have enough sense to decide. We live in a time uh, when, again, uh, we're pleased that abortion in America is down to 1.2 million babies a year. We're, we're, we're happy about that. That's a good number. One million children aborted every year. And, and, and that's down. Imagine that. We live in a time uh, when, when, uh, you know, when, when uh, we have the, the courts of all levels, at every level, uh, making decisions of taking uh, the words in God we trust out of the pledge of requiring uh, businesses or trying to require uh, businesses to say uh, and to provide Uh, abortion coverage for their employees. We live in a time uh, that most of us uh, never dreamed we would see. Uh, If we look around and uh, you take someone who is uh, 20, 25 years old uh, to imagine just the the decline they have seen in our nation in just that time period. Some of you uh, who have lived just slightly longer than 20 or 25 years are dumbfounded where uh, where you don't even recognize the place is what it amounts to. You, You don't even realize uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, if there was a way uh, to take, uh, take you and to wipe your memory uh, where you didn't know anything about the history uh, of the United States and who we say we are and, and who we claim to be, and I was to drop you in America and you were to turn on the television, you were to read the paper, you were to go out in the streets, and I would tell you that this was a nation based and formed on the Word of God. If I would tell you that this was a nation that uh, had uh, been born on on Christian principles, that there was a time when to be elected to office, you had to proclaim and and agree that I am a Christian or you wouldn't even be uh, elected. If I were to tell you those things and you were to look around America today, you would call me a liar. You, you, there's no way you would believe that that's what this country was founded on, that those were the principles uh, that this country was based on just a few years ago. And as we look at our country, I think there are three things from Jeremiah, again, Nineveh, uh, most any of these nations that we can look at and say are lessons that America uh, needs to read and to heed to understand uh, these three lessons. Very simple, very straightforward. First one is very simply this. God promises, there is a promise of repentance. Look what God says in this verse. God says to the people, He says, of what instant? He says, uh, I, I will speak concerning a nation. He says, and concerning the kingdom, to pluck it up and to pull it down. We may be a great nation in America, 
And, and let me say this. I still think we are the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We are still the best boat afloat. I, I still, uh, you know, I'm not packing my bags going nowhere. We are still, I think, the best nation. That doesn't mean that we don't have room for improvement. That doesn't mean that we're all we used to be or all that we could be. And God says here in this verse, I will pluck them up. I will pull them down. I will destroy them against who I have pronounced uh, uh, turn from evil. I will repent of the evil that I have thought to do in it. You know what God says? God says it's not inevitable. I realize today that there are a lot of people, there are a lot of preachers who are standing up and saying America is doomed. America is destined for destruction. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes when you read the news, sometimes when you hear what's going on, it's really hard to argue with them. But according to the Word of God, God says if we will turn if there will be repentance in our land, he says, I will repent. I will turn from the evil that I have promised to do. I've used this illustration a, a thousand times, I know. But when God says repent, I, I want to remind you what he says. Repent doesn't mean slow down. Repent doesn't mean that it's good that we are down to 1.2 million abortions. That's not good. That's not good. I mean, it's better than 1.3, but it's not good. It won't be good in my mind, and I believe in the mind of God, till it's zero. That's when it'll be good. That's when it'll be right. That's when it'll be good that God, the way God designed it. So let me tell you one of the things that was going on in Judah. Let me tell you one of the practices that had taken place in that time. One of the things they were doing was they had built a, a large idol. And that idol had a big hollow stomach. And they would take that idol and they would build a huge fire under that idol. And they would get it scorching hot. And they would take their small babies. They would take their infants. And they would take them and lay them up in the hollow spot in that idol and burn their infants, burn their children to death. How many of you agree that's rather disgusting? Can you tell me that it's much different? We may not be burning them in an idol, but is there much difference in what's taking place in abortion clinics all over America? They were at least doing it supposedly in the name of religion. Do you know that the, a vast portion, at one time I could get these numbers, but because of the privacy laws, I can't get them anymore. But at one time I could get the, the numbers on abortion in Cabarrus County. And do you know that a vast number of the abortions, I think if I remember correctly, it was right around 40% of the abortions performed in Cabarrus County were for sex preference. You know what I mean by that? They were having a boy and wanted a girl or vice versa. And so they said, let's abort this one and try again. It's not enough to slow down. One of my favorite little jokes, you've, you've heard it I'm sure, is the guy who rolls through the stop sign. And the policeman turns on the lights and pulls him over. He says, you rolled through that stop line, stop light, stop sign. He says, yeah, but I slowed down. And when he did, the policeman grabs him and clamps a handcuff on him, handcuffs in the door, pulls out his billy stick and just goes to beating the daylights out of him. He says, now, do you want me to stop or do you want me to slow down? There's a difference. But I want to tell you something this morning. God won't even be happy when we stop. Repentance, you see that word that he says there? Turn from evil. See, it's not enough for us to lower the crime rate. It's not enough for us to lower the abortion rate. God says, I don't want you just to slow down. I don't want you to even stop. I want you to turn around and move towards me. It won't be, if tomorrow everything that we despise, if everything going on in America that we consider to be against God, that we consider to be anti-biblical, if every one of those things tomorrow, when we woke up, they were stopped immediately. There was no more pornography, no more drugs, no more homosexuality, no more abortion. If all those things that we say we are opposed to, that we believe the Bible is against, if every one of those stopped tomorrow, God still would not be satisfied. Do you understand that? God doesn't say, I just want you to stop. He says, I want you to turn towards me. It's not enough to stop being wicked. He says, I want you to start being godly. I, I want you to start being like me. I want you to start being the man, the woman that I want you to be. And God is saying to the United States, I don't want you just to stop being wicked. I want you to start being godly. And if you do, I promise you, I won't do the evil. See, there's a promise of repentance. God says, if we will change, He'll spare us. He'll spare us. 
Second thing that I noticed, the second thing that I noticed about how God deals with Judah that I think applies to America, and in many ways, I'll be honest with you, this one scares me the most. I, I, I tell you the truth, this concerns me the most. It's the potential of rebuke. Look what Jeremiah says to Judah. He says to him, he says that they can speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom. He says to build it, to plant it, and to do evil in my sight. He said that, I, that they don't obey my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Let me say that in my opinion, in my opinion only, you feel, to feel free to have a different opinion. In my opinion, this is where America is today. I believe this is exactly what's happening to our nation today. Because what God says in His verse, and again, I believe in many ways this is, is one of His worst forms of punishment. God says, you know what? To this nation who fails to repent, I'm going to stop doing the good that I would have done. If you know anything about history, you know that in all honesty, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't. The pilgrims should have starved. You know, we, we, should, have, we should have lost, uh, you know, we, we should have probably, you know, we should be probably speaking German or Japanese or something. You know, there, there's no way... We should have ever been able to beat the British Army. You know, you, you go back and some of you, you know, go back and read your history. You go back and you read the Revolutionary War history. They had us outmanned, outgunned, out everything. We, you know, we, we just were, we were blessed by God. That's all you can say. You know, the fact that th those pilgrims were able to even get here, the fact that they, they were e even able to survive the trip, the fact that the, that, that the Indians didn't run them off, everything. Yeah, everything you read about the history of this nation, We've been blessed by God. You know, we like to think, oh, we're mighty. And, and, and thank God for our military. Don't misunderstand me. Thank God. I mean, we, we you know, but, and for the young men and women that serve, but let's be honest, we've been blessed by God. Blessed by God. Listen, we can have the strongest, mightiest, biggest military, the best equipped military in the history of the world. And if God says here, I'm tired of the clay, can I tell you something? If God decides it, the Jamaican army could come up here and beat us. And I don't even know if they've got an army. Can I tell you something? If God decides, let me, let, some, of you, some of you won't get this, but if, if God decides it, we could lose to the French. There's a few of you that get that. Some of you need to go home and read your history. We could lose to Switzerland if God decides it. We've been blessed by God. And what concerns me greatly, and again, this, this is the one that concerns me the most, is not so much God destroying America, but God just removing His protecting, blessing hand. And let us reap what we have sown. That concerns me. Because God says that is the second step. When a nation refuses to repent, He says, I will stop doing the good that I would have done for them. Can I ask you just to look around for a moment and think about recent history? Some of you here are old enough, and you don't have to be very old, to be honest with you, that the thought of a terrorist attack on our soul would have never entered your mind. That was something they did in Palestine. That was something that happened in Israel. Not happened in New York. Not happened in Boston. Certainly not out in the Midwest in a place like Oklahoma City by one of our very own. Most of you would have never... Never dreamed that just a few years ago you would have went to bed one night and woke up the next day and the banks that you had known forever were gone. Shut down. Closed. That the banks would go bankrupt. 
Now, some of you may have seen it coming because of your preference, but you would have never imagined that General Motors would have to be bailed out by the government. Some of the Ford people said, yes, I would have. Yeah. Think about it. The things that have happened in this nation that you would have never dreamed would have happened. You go back and you look, Vietnam, Korea, how over the years it appears, and again, my opinion, but it's my turn to preach. You can preach next week. You can share your opinion. But my opinion, when you look over time in the last 30, 40 years, and as the wickedness of, of America has grown, how God has just slowly pulled back and said, all right, you want to do it without me? Go ahead. Go ahead. I believe God is allowing us to reap what we have sown. Can I give you one quick example? Can I point to the economy and tell you, do a little math, and since the early 70s, when we have aborted somewhere in the range, I don't know the exact number, somewhere in the range of 40 million children, do you know that that first group of children would be around 40 years old now? They would be buying homes and having children. Some of them would probably be even having grandchildren by now. They'd be buying diapers. They'd be shopping at the stores. They'd be doing business with some of you. But instead, they're a statistic. That first group would be about 40 years old now. Which means in all likelihood, many of them could have children that were in their early 20s. Which means they themselves could actually have children. And think of the money that would generate. Think of all, and, and think about that. We've got that number that was aborted, but think of all the children. If each one of those would have had two children, and some of those children then would have, think about the numbers we're talking about. And God says, I'm going to let you reap what you sow. The potential of God just slowly pulling His hand off of America. To be honest with you, concerns me much more than just wiping us out. Of allowing us to reap our own harvest. Allowing the things that we've done to come home to roost, as we put it. God says, I was going to do good, but because of their evil, I'm going to pull back my hand. The potential of rebuke. Then he says the final step. And I, I believe, again, it's my, my opinion. And, you know, here's what's funny. I said this at the early service this morning. If I would have said this not too many years ago, the congregation would have got up and walked out laughing, thinking I was a maniac. That I believe that we're in that stage of God pulling back His hand, sitting right on the precipice of the pain of rejection. Look what he says. He says, I'll go and I'll go in and the inhabitants and I will frame evil against you and devise a device against you and return you ever now if you don't return from your evil. What he says, he says, I'm going to do you like the potter with the clay and wipe you out. Do you know that as little as a hundred years ago that one of the popular beliefs, much of the preaching from the pulpits across America was this. That we're getting so good. We are so well behaved. And we are so good. We just keep getting gooder and gooder. I don't even know if those are words. We just keep getting gooder and gooder. And we're getting so good that we're just going to usher in heaven right here on earth. And then World War I came along. And World War II. And Korea and Vietnam. We realized, hmm, maybe we were wrong. If I was to stand up today and tell you, we're just getting gooder and gooder. We're getting so good, we're just going to usher heaven in. Even Tanner's shaking his head. Young man at his age knows better. But you think about it. 
as little as 100 years ago, if a preacher would have stood up and said America is doomed, he'd have been laughed out of the pulpit. But today, there's no one who looks around, at, no one with a couple of brain cells to scrub together that looks at America and says she's on the right path except for a few of those that somehow or another have managed to be in charge. God says, repent and I'll bless you. But if you don't, I'll start removing my hand. And eventually, I'll allow you to be destroyed. Not too long after Jeremiah prophesied these words, the armies of Babylon came in and wiped out Judah. Destroyed them. The very people of God, His chosen. Israel was already in that condition. And Judah was soon to follow. Now let's make this very personal. America is a group collection of states and counties and towns and cities. She doesn't have a heart. The heart of America is the heart of her people. And if we're going to see a change in our nation, it begins by seeing a change in her people. And can I remind you that God wasn't speaking to the Philistines or the Babylonians. He was speaking to His people. If we're going to see a change, in America. It's going to have to begin under the steeples of this land. It's not going to happen in Washington. Don't fool yourself. I don't care which one you send up there. It won't matter. It won't happen in Raleigh. It won't happen downtown in the Pink Palace. It'll happen when God's people humble themselves and call on Him and not before. Can I make it even more personal? I believe God deals with individuals the very same way. When individuals pursue evil, pursue wickedness instead of the things of God, God says, I'll take my hand off of you and I'll let you reap what you sow. And eventually, the wages of sin is death. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. You're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm a Christian. I know I am. There's no doubt in my mind. Can I challenge you? And some of you already do. I know I, sometimes I call on you to pray, and this is part of your prayer every time. But can I encourage you? Can I challenge you for my children's sake, for your grandchildren's sake, your children's sake, your great-grandchildren's sake? Pray for repentance in America. We often talk about pray for revival. And I don't necessarily know what you mean by revival sometimes. I don't even, I'm not sure what it means anymore. So let's be very specific. Let's pray for repentance. That means not slowing down, not stopping, but turning from our evil and turning towards God. But it begins with me. It begins with you. I want to invite you to come to this altar this morning. You say, I know I'm a child of God. And I want to pray for my nation. I want to pray that we'll see a repentance that leads to revival. You're not going to have revival without repentance. I want to pray for those in office. I want to pray most of all for myself. You're here today and you don't know Christ. You've never accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Listen, God is saying the very same thing to you. He says to Judah that He says to nations. If you don't turn from your evil... I want to remove my hand and allow you to reap what you sow, which ultimately ends with you spending an eternity separated from God in a devil's hell. If you're here today and you don't know Him as your Savior, would you come? Let me show you from God's Word how you can know Him. Church doors open. God's brought you here. You've been saved and will be part of this church family. Whatever God leads you to do this morning as we stand together.